it almost seems like the different writers of the gospels it's almost like those differences come up in a sense of interpretation of events maybe mm-hmm. maybe like how we talked about before people can ex- go to the same place but have a different interpretation of the same event but more emphasis on one thing or another so for example all three of us were an event i write about specifically details about the event and maybe in that event, there is a band, but I never write that there is a band. But maybe you write that there is a band. Right. Or, and then Jose could write that there is a, you know, people doing art, crafts, and so forth. Doesn't necessarily imply that I'm contradicting Jose or you, but rather that we're looking at it from a different view. And yeah. we have to see that from the Gospels as well, because Matthew was looking at it from a different view than Luke was. It yeah. was also writing to a different crowd. That's true. And they all had different lives. And maybe I right. picked up on something that you didn't pick up on. And when you put them together, though, then it starts to make sense, as we've been kind of mentioning. And then also, like, the idea of, like, oh, they entered, they kind of, what they took from Jesus' sacrifice was to fight the devil. Maybe someone else took something else from the sacrifice that he was doing it for another reason. And so I don't see that as a contradiction. I just see it as people experiencing and interpreting the events of Jesus in different ways. Uh, it was an oral tradition, so not a lot of things were written. And then at that time period, we don't have that much record of a lot of historical figures. As he points out with Alexander the Great, we know a lot of his information 200 to 300 years right after his death. Compare that to Jesus, who was, you know, maybe 30. You could even conclude that um, Mark was in AD 60. But still, that's 30 years, 28 years after his death, which is pretty close. Compare that to, for example, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and so forth. So the closeness of the Gospels to Jesus is, you know, doesn't compare to, for example, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. It's the same process of in terms of how it was recorded in history. So it's like, well, if we're going to question Jesus, why don't we question the same process that was used? For Caesar and Alexander. Right. When was Jesus born, right? Because, you know, Matthew says, you know, he was w- born in, in one year. Another one says he was born in another year. And then I think there was also questions in terms of, you know, Herod being, you know, still alive. What Was he really alive? Was there really a persecution? The main argument is that in Matthew, we see that Jesus is born in the late years of uh, Herod. And in Luke, you, there's mention of the first census that was done by a governor at that time by the name of Quirinius. Quirinius was a governor after Herod's death. So that's mentioned by Josephus, who was a uh, historian in the first century. So the skeptic would say, well, if Jesus was born during the late times of Herod, but then in the other gospel, he mentions that he was born during the the governorship of Quirinius, that means that it's contradicting itself. I think we have to look at the Gospels and more specifically the New Testament as people who are not specifically trying to put evidence in every single thing. Their objective in the Gospels is to bring the good news. So obviously, if they're going to give something such as, you know, a birth or a scenario they're not going to go so much, much deep toe in it because obviously the whole message of the gospel was to bring the good news. What we could find also is that there is a connection between that of Matthew and that of Luke. Uh, scholars have pointed out that whenever uh, Luke 2.2, 2, where it reads that, you know, the first census that was done by Quirinius, so the term first doesn't really refer to first, but rather before. The term is used as the genitive Greek case as protos, which by the way means before, as we as it's also mentioned in John 115, John 130, and John 1518. This is also proposed by scholars such as uh, N.T. Wright and also Oxford scholars such as Liddell Scott, as well as the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament by Barr. So technically speaking, if that's the case, then it would match up with the Gospel of Matthew because the census was done before the governorship of Quirinius. So a lot of scholars have pointed out that the term first is misguided. It, rather, protos, which is the Greek, is actually referred to before, not first. 
kind of interesting how how the the translation came to to come across as first primer because uh, I, I have a, a Spanish Bible and and it also says first or primer. How would you uh, say like I mean somebody that you know doesn't speak Greek and and just kind of picks up the Bible? How are they supposed to know that you know? I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure that through through research, they they can come to the same conclusion, right? But to somebody that's just reading it and says like, "Well, I I didn't know like why why does it say first then here? Why haven't they changed?" Well, it goes to my other argument that his scholars have pointed out. So, the the term that is used first in Luke actually signifies an historical time period. First means is the first census, but clearly. In, in Roman times, specifically in the book of the deeds of Augustus, there were several census that were done not only during the time of the governorship of Quirinius, but they were also done way before. So whenever they were referred to the first census, they were referred to the first census under him, but there was also other census that were going on throughout the um, BC era or AD, which again, BC and AD are things that are uh, made later on in order to have some form of connection within history. But in the, er the early era, there was no such thing as AD or BC. Is there, is there a, a time or a date where, where Herod actually lived? Like an actual, does that go, coincide with Jesus' birth? During the, his late years, that's when Jesus was born. And then after that, mm -hmm. in the beginning of AD is when Quirinius became governor. So Herod was in the late BC during the times of Jesus' birth, but then he died before the governorship of Quirinius. That's how we know that from Josephus. And a lot of times, a lot of people who look at the New Testament, they look at certain words and, and uh, have to go back to the Greek in order to identify certain, um, you know, translations. Because obviously when you're translating the Greek to the English, it doesn't translate the exact same words. There's two, three meanings, four meanings. So in all those meanings, it's also referring to not only as governor, but also as leader or chief. And some of the bigger question is, I mean, how do we know that prophecy exists? Well, that's actually a different question. But from an historical point of view, the prophecy that is found in the Old Testament from a typological form is the reason why uh, they had to go to Bethlehem, which is the lineage of, of Joseph, to be honest, because Joseph is from Bethlehem. And that's the reason why he also had to go back to Bethlehem in order to do the census, because obviously, if you're originally from a country um, during the census, you have to go and, you know, do the census with your household and so forth and your original home. Why didn't Mary just stay and do the census at, in Nazareth since she's in Nazareth? Why did she got, have to go with Joseph? It was, it's mostly done by prophecy that was found in the Old Testament to the New. So whenever I mentioned the Magi went to Herod and said, you know, um, like, why are you here? I come to see the Christ. And the ones who were near Herod, who were the scribes or the um, Pharisees were telling him, you know, it's is Christ who was prophesied in the Old Testament. So even in the New Testament, it's referring to going back to um, the prophecy of the Old Testament. The person was asking if there are other writings, except because they were saying it was only recorded in the Gospels and stuff like that. We have from non-Christian sources, Pliny the Younger, Tacitus, and Flavius of Josephus. Now, he mentions that Josephus' accounts of Jesus was, was corrupted. I just don't see that anywhere where it's corrupted, because obviously if he, he assumes that Josephus' accounts are corrupted, then he will also has to refer to uh, his argument about the senses of Josephus to be corrupted as well, mm -hmm. and other writings of Josephus to be corrupted. So, and But I wouldn't say that Josephus was corrupted the same way as I wouldn't say that he was corrupted in him giving the senses of Quirinius. I think it all comes together. The, the commentator was pointing out that um, Jesus could not, could not do mighty work in his, um, mm. in his hometown, I believe, where, his, yeah, where they knew him as family, and that he decided not to do it, not because um, it was because of how they received him, 
and he could just not do miracles for some reason because just because there's a handful of people not believing him to be a god and so they're questioning well if he's omnipotent and he's powerful then why can't he perform miracles whenever he wants to you know yeah yeah um yeah i think that the gospel of matthew himself he he also for example whenever he doesn't do some miracles he knows exactly the other individual's heart and mind i think that's in a way a miracle because obviously human beings cannot read minds or cannot read hearts so we kind of have to look back and say okay maybe it's not some miracle where he could turn water into wine but it's something that he could read thoughts or he could read the heart which is something that humans cannot don't have the capacity to do not only that but you know Jesus and throughout the other gospels does miracles left and right. He's being